for Krima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulekai. Joining me today is researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sadna, here to unpack his column titled ANC Collapse Relates to Breaking from Its Liberation Movement Character. You paint the picture of the ANC becoming a political party as if it was a conspiratorial development. So is that how you wanted the readers to understand it? Well, I was involved. I was in the leadership of the ANC from 1990-91 till about 1997. And we never have made a decision that the ANC should become a political party. Um, and in fact, it has become very much like a conventional political party that you will find in the UK or the US, where the only part that the membership plays in the organization is to vote every five years. And they may be encouraged to vote, especially in a situation where the voting tallies are tight between the ANC and other parties, as is the case now. I say there's a conspiratorial element because when I was at what used to be called Shell House in the early 1990s, I used to be head of political education. Every now and again, we'd be called to a meeting in the boardroom or something, and knew nothing about it. And was someone coming to explain to us how you manage things and what have you, and was a way of making the ANC into something different from mass popular movement. And I was concerned about it because in the national executive, which I sat in, we never heard about these meetings. And I think it was part of a process uh, about which some of us knew nothing, uh, but it was a process that some people wanted to see happen, that the ANC would become a different type of organization. Obviously, there must have been other talks because uh, the only time that the masses came into it in that period, 1990 to 1994, or the main uh, period when they came into it, was if they were needed to, as a sort of battering ram to break a deadlock in the talks. So the masses were not part of a dialogue between leaders and membership members themselves debating things. They were needed in needed there to bring the country to a standstill or something like that after Chris Harney's death or in order to ensure that a deadlock was broken in the negotiations. And so what, what I'm suggesting is that the process of transition happened partly behind closed doors. Now, I'm not meaning the conspiracy with big capital or something like that, but people, knew, some people knew more about what was going on than others, and they pursued that direction of preparing people for the civil service, preparing to have a, a type of politics which is more conventionally like that, in Western Europe, and the rest of us who came from insurrection, we were still adapting to negotiations, and we were not part of some of those talks. We had formal meetings where we did approve what the negotiators did and things like that, but that's not the same as sitting and hammering out how do we get from point A to point B. And why do you think that the Western governments and business people all unnamed that you mentioned were so keen for the ANC to become a political party. And what was in it for them? Well, you see, they want to have a government that they can talk to, a government that they can work with. And this idea of mass action, mass organization, it becomes a notion of politics with which they're not accustomed and it's very hard for them 
to find someone to talk to if they come in their thousands and want to see the chair of some company or some such things. So they prefer a situation where the ANC is like the Labour Party or Conservative Party in Britain. You know that if the Labour Party wins, you talk to the Prime Minister. They have this idea that mass activity is for them chaos. They don't have guidelines as to how to deal with them. Also, you suggest that the Western political parties do not have regular contact with constituencies. So is that a pattern and does it then mean there's a big difference between proportional representation and constituencies in that respect? You see, I wrote this in the context of the ANC becoming a conventional party and moving away from close contact with its constituency. Now, a lot of people argue that one of the problems with South Africa is we don't have a constituency system, so you can't recall your MP and things like that. Now, I think people have an idea of what happens in the constituency system that is partly myth. When MPs go to Parliament in Westminster, if they come from the north, from Manchester or from uh, Edinburgh or places like this, they actually um, don't have regular contact with their constituency. Uh, they, they, even if they want to, they have to be in Westminster the whole week, and if some th- or even two weeks, and uh, sometimes there's some controversial issue, and how it is dealt with is the caucus of that organization will discuss it. And some very democratic MP may phone his or her constituency in some place and say, this is the situation. We're going to take a vote on it on Thursday. Can you people discuss it? And then we talk tomorrow and we can discuss it. Now, some MPs are very diligent about doing this. They said this about Jeremy Corbyn, that he was very diligent in doing it. And... Um, but most of the time, my impression is that it's a myth to suggest that the constituency system always brings MPs or brings them, even most of the time, into close contact with their members. I've heard of very few cases where the members had this close contact. And lastly, Raymond, are you not exaggerating when you say the ANC was a popular mass party at the time of unbanning? You know, the ANC, it's conventional to separate them into exile, underground, MK, uh, and the open activities of the UDF, which were not formally ANC, but in many ways were connected. And I think it's important to understand that when there was a situation of forced removals, for example, sometimes MK attacked police stations in those areas. So that that's one part of the military, which is also part of the mass movement. They have different identities. They're not only one, because the same person who's underground one day will be taking part in a teacher's, uh, uh, say, a parent's meeting at a school the next day. So that the ANC was a number of different things. And uh, consequently, for it to operate, for example, in some of the Bantistans, it was not possible for the ANC to go there and issue membership cards. If you had a membership card, you would have been arrested straight away. And often they didn't have direct contact. And people organized ANC units for themselves. I did interviews on this in these Bantustans, whereby they listened to Radio Freedom or they looked at ANC pamphlets and they worked out what they were to do. So the ANC was a mass presence as well as a strategic guide outside the country. And often in the later years, people would go and visit 
Lusaka and see them and get guidelines from that. So I do think the ANC, which was unbanned, immediately had 30,000, 40,000 members. I think it could have been 100,000 before the first conference. And there were lots of people who wanted to join who could only join in 1990. So it was a mass organization, and not in the same way as the UDF. The UDF was a mass organization by virtue of having affiliates from a number of different sectors, uh, workers, education, small businesses, health workers, things like that. ANC represented people from those sectors, but it was not specifically a sectoral organization. It was a mass popular organization. That was Professor Raymond Sutner speaking to Crimea Media's Polity about ANC collapse relates to breaking from its liberation movement character.